Thank you to the organizers. Thank you all for being here. Uh, my name is Nadia Ben Youssef. I'm the director of the Adela Justice Project, and I have been working for the last seven years with Adela, the Legal Center for Arab Minority Rights in Israel. Um, and this is why this is why we're here. I hope you all, this is why you're here, um, to listen to Yazam's story, to think a bit beyond crude figures and statistics that often rule our decision making. In fact, we are here because of Yazan, we are here because of Yusuf and Muhammad. Um, this is a human issue. It's a human issue. Politics is a human issue. We are lawyers, we'll talk a bit about the legal regime and the legal system, but we are talking about human beings. And this is an urgent issue because of that. 50 years. 50 years. What was happening 50 years ago? Yazan's father wasn't even born 50 years ago. This is a human issue. I'm going to talk and contextualize the occupation and bring us back a little bit into the historic depth, the legal regime that governs people's lives. But as I speak, remember that we are talking about people's lives. 50 years of occupation. 50 years of occupation, but it didn't happen in a vacuum. It didn't just emerge out of nothing. It is grounded in history. It's grounded in history, it's grounded in a historical and a legal context that predates the occupation, that predates 1967, as often these issues do. There's a historic debt that we have to be committed to uncovering and to understanding, because if we don't understand the problem, how can we possibly understand the solution? So the occupation is often understood as this blight, this anomaly um, in the history of Israel. Emerged, potentially if we are at our best, acknowledging that it's problematic, that there are violations that are happening, but it's distinct from uh, Israel, it's distinct from the legal and political regime of the Israeli government. It's over there, something bad is happening, and it's completely different and disconnected to Israel, which is known as the only democracy in the Middle East. It's understood as founded on principles of equality and justice, and that is simply not true. So I want to bring us back to 1948. And I actually also want to shout out a, a curriculum that might be useful that's being launched this summer by the US Campaign for Palestinian Rights. And it looks actually at the breadth of this history under the idea of 170, 50, 10, 100 years since the Balfour Declaration in 1917, 70 years since the Partition Plan of 1947, 50 years of occupation and 10 years since the siege on Gaza. This is a history. This is a history. But I'm going to talk about 1948 because it's critical and it grounds a lot of what I'm going to be talking about, particularly with regard to Palestinian citizens of Israel and how that connects to the occupation. The occupation is an outgrowth. The occupation is a symptom. We're going to begin the story in 1948, and it's called the Nakba. And I want you all to remember that name, write that name, say that name, Nakba, N-A-K-B-A. -A. The Nakba means catastrophe in Arabic. And it refers to the founding of the State of Israel, the dispossession of Palestinian land, the displacement of around 750,000 people, the demolition of 500 villages, the catastrophe. What happened in the Nakba really grounds our understanding of what's going on both inside Israel and in the occupied Palestinian territory. Because the Nakba set up a legal and political regime that critically privileged the rights of certain people on the basis of who they are, subjugated, conditioned, or suspended the rights of others on the basis of who they are. The legal regime of Israel that was established in 1948 was premised on this idea that the Jewish people were deserving of more rights than any non-Jewish person that was living in that land. Israel was established as a Jewish state to privilege the rights of Jewish people. The Nakba occurred, 750,000 people became refugees. 
including Yezan's family. 750,000 people became refugees. 150,000 people stayed, remained on their land, remained inside this new Israel, this new Jewish state of Israel. Palestinians who <coughs> remained on their land and ultimately became citizens in 1952, so just a few years later became citizens, 150,000 people, who now make up one point, let's say 1.3 million people, or 20% of the population of Israel. One in five Israelis is a Palestinian. I'm going to say that again. One in five Israelis is a Palestinian. 20% of the population is not Jewish. 20% of the population of this Jewish state that is premised on the basis that you must have greater rights. You are, you are privileged with more resources. You are privileged with more rights on the basis of your identity. One in five of those citizens is not Jewish. How do you protect the rights of non-Jews in a Jewish state? What does this mean? Omar, he opened with this idea of a Jewish and democratic state. Can you be both a Jewish state that privileges the rights of certain people on the basis of who they are and claim to be a democracy that guarantees equality for all? Does that make sense? We say it like so. We say it so easily. Obama says it. Our presidents say it. We say it in, in, this, in the corridors of power, a Jewish and democratic state. As if that makes sense. As if that makes sense. The ideas about what that, what that means and what the impact is, is most visible in, in three areas. So I'm going to talk about three main areas um, and then close with a story, a human story, that ties, I think, a lot of these things together. Um, in fact, though, I want to say one more thing about this history before I go into kind of how the legal regime was grounded. So we have, again, 150,000 people, right, who remained, became citizens. But what's critical here, and how it ties us into the story of the occupation, is that from 1948 until 1966, 18 years, the first years of the establishment of the State of Israel, these Palestinian citizens of Israel lived under a military regime. Lived under a military regime. We've heard what that means. We understand what a military regime is permit restrictions, administrative detention, restrictions on freedom of movement, tanks, surveillance in your, in your cities and on your streets and in your villages. It's an important date, right? Until 1966, they lived under a military regime. What happened in 1967? What are we commemorating now? The transfer of that military regime to the occupied Palestinian territory and the systems of land confiscation and displacement that I'm gonna talk about quickly um, were in practice first, and were practiced first on Palestinian citizens of Israel. So land confiscation. So the founding of the state really is about confiscating Palestinian land and concentrating that land into the, into the power and into the, into the hands of the state. So you had a number of land laws that justified that confiscation and ended up so that Israel now owns and controls 93% of the land of the state. So all of that Palestinian land was confiscated, it's in control of the state, um, and formalized in law. Formalized in law. So you have massive con concentration and confiscation of land, dispossession of, of Palestinian ownership of that land, and as the state is established, there's a founding law that I think is quite critical, which defines what, how you maintain this Jewish nature of the state, which is called the law of return. Are you familiar with the law of return? The law of return which allows any Jewish person anywhere in the world to automatically become a citizen of the state. If you're a Jewish person anywhere in the world, you can automatically become a citizen of the state. The law of return, the ingathering of the exiles, as, as declared in the Declaration of Independence. So the law of return should be understood as coupled, as yoked with, and this is how the, these laws work, the denial of the Palestinian refugees' right of return. Right, so all of, um, any Jewish person in the world can automatically become a citizen and any Palestinian who became a refugee cannot return to their land. Because I, the idea of the Jewish state is to maintain a demographic majority uh, at ownership of the land and to maintain a demographic majority in the space of the land. So that means more Jewish people than anyone else in that land in order to maintain this idea of a democracy. We're tying demography numbers of people to the idea of democracy. 
which is, which is quite important. So you have the confiscation of land, um, you have, good, two minutes, easy. Uh, the confiscation of land, the demolition of homes. So what was happening in the Nakba continues to today. So as we were looking at figures from 2012 to 2014, 97% of home demolitions occurred in Arab localities. So I, if you remember the Nakba, 500 villages were destroyed, right? 500 villages, over 500. Um, about 130, 139 villages remained. So the remaining Palestinians were concentrated in those 139 villages. There has not been one new Palestinian village created inside Israel. Not one new one, but the population has boomed. So it's 150,000 people who are now 1.3 million people still living in 139 Palestinian villages. So you have huge overcrowding and concentration of people. And, um, and what has happened is because there's limits on permits and limits to the natural growth of these villages for various reasons, as Yazan said, people are building unauthorized buildings. Very difficult to get permits, there's no natural growth, there are no new places to live, so people are, who are having children and growing and there's natural growth have nowhere to go, they're building unauthorized buildings. In 2000, in April of this year, a law was passed called the Kemenitz Law that's trying to streamline the demolition of these unauthorized buildings, taking them outside of the court structure and saying you can just demolish them. If you see it, it's an unauthorized building, demolish it, there's no recourse in law. This is legalized and passed in 2017. So the confiscation of land, the home demolitions, that I hope resonates, because we've heard a bit about that in the occupied Palestinian territories happening uh, inside, um, inside Israel. So the confiscation continues, the demolitions are legalized, and the land regime continues to benefit, continues to benefit Jewish citizens and deny the rights of Palestinian citizens. So the land regime is formulated in this way. Citizenship is similarly formula formulated, and I think that's critical. I told you that these Palestinians became citizens, were granted citizenship in 1952, but it's an interesting citizenship. It's a citizenship that, that's bifurcated into citizenship and nationality. Citizenship is Israeli, nationality is either Jewish or Arab. Your citizenship is Israeli, but your nationality is Jewish or Arab. Why? because we have to find a way to distinguish so that we can allocate resources and allocate rights accordingly. So citizenship in the law has entrenched a hierarchy, <coughs> a hierarchy of life and a hierarchy of values. So the Citizenship Law of 1952. Last Sunday, Adela was in court um, and that I was in court defending a young man whose citizenship is about to be revoked. So something important is happening apparently in Washington on the, on the idea of loyalty. Oats, and uh, in, 19, in 2008, there was an amendment to the citizenship law that says you can revoke citizenship. Why? For a breach of loyalty. For a breach of loyalty. So these citizens who might seem to be unloyal or perceived to be disloyal to the state can have their citizenship revoked, and that's being used primarily and only against Palestinian citizens of Israel. It's prohibited by international law. Citizenship is conditional. Citizenship is conditional, and it leads us to what I think we've been talking about a, a bit now, too, in terms of accountability and impunity, and what is the impact when your life is not valued we know that, as American citizens, what that means. The impact on your life when your life is not valued by the state means that your life can be taken away. That there is no, there is no accountability if that happens, and that indeed is the case for Palestinian citizens of Israel. From 2012 till 2016, around 90% 90 90 of cases of police violence were closed, the vast majority without investigations. For extrajudicial killings and extrajudicial executions that Brad and Yezan talked about, Indictments are so small to be zero. The, the indictment against uh, Nadim's killer is such an anomaly in these situations. So indictments are zero. Since 2000, 48 Palestinian citizens of Israel have been killed by police and there is no accountability for their deaths. When your life is not valued, your life can be taken away. When the law doesn't protect your rights and doesn't deem you to be equal, the situation is for Palestinian citizens of Israel, for Palestinians living under occupation, 
is the same. When your life is not valued, you can hold millions of people under a military regime. When your lives and your rights are not valued, you can be demoted in your citizenship. Your citizenship can be revoked. You can live for 10 years under a siege and blockade in an open-air prison. If your life is not valued, if the law doesn't protect your rights, then this is the situation. The occupation is a symptom of this problem. There's no right to equality in Israel, and I think you need to write that down and send that message to your decision makers. There's no right to equality in Israel. It's not enshrined in law. There's no such thing as the right to equality enshrined in law because they cannot protect equality and protect privilege. You cannot both protect equality and protect privilege. The story that I want to close with is a story of Uman Hiran, and I think it brings all of these things together. Uman Hiran is an unrecognized village in the Naqab, in the south of Israel, Um al Hiran. It was established by military order in 1956. So the people were moved from their homes near Gaza to this place in Um al Hiran, where they lived for 60 years. Um, where they lived for 60 years. But it was an unrecognized village. This is a phenomenon that's pretty unique to Israel. Unrecognized village means that it doesn't exist on any state map, even though the state established this village. It doesn't exist on any state map. There's no infrastructure, no water, no electricity, no roads. These are citizens of Israel. They've lived there for 60 years. Um In 2003, demolition orders were issued on all of the homes in Um Hiran. We're talking about Um and Natir, these twin villages. We're talking 1,000 people. Home demolition orders on all of their homes. The reason that the homes are being demolished is to establish a Jewish town called Hiran. Remember that name. Um al Hiran, the Bedouin village, Hiran, the Jewish town. These homes are being demolished in order to establish a Jewish town on top of their ruins. Adala represented this case before the courts and went all the way to the Israeli Supreme Court. It was 13 years of litigation challenging this notion that you could displace people on the basis of who they are and put on top of them other people with more rights, the better citizens. And we challenged that in the Israeli Supreme Court and we lost. And we lost the case. The court said, yes, fine, we gave you that land, but we can take it away. You are not the right kind of citizens. The court didn't say that. I'm saying that. But we can take it away. These are not the right kind of citizens. This is happening in Umar Hiran. So in 2000, in 2017, the demolitions began. The demolitions began against these communities. Um, 15 structures were demolished, 15 structures were demolished, 8 homes were demolished in, in Umm al-Hiran. I just saw it for the first time two weeks ago with Brad and I was, I was shocked to have seen it. Um, I wasn't expecting it. What happened in, in 2017 is that as the, before the home was being demolished, what happens is people are rushing to take their, their valuables out of their home. So this man, Yakub Abulkian, 50 years old, a math teacher, the father of 13 children, took all of those possessions out of his home, his computers, his uh, anything valuable that he could, and he put them in his truck, and he started to go, he started to move away from the site, and the police killed him. The police shot at the moving vehicle, he was killed, his, his car veered into police, and, he, and the car killed a police officer, and immediately the police said, this was a terrorist attack, the man was ramming into the police officers. Um, he was part of ISIS, and uh, the the public security minister Gilad Erdan immediately said, "You know, this is um, we are responding." He was killed. It was a, a successful successful um, stopping of a terrorist attack, um, and immediately the footage came out as well, which showed that the police fired first, and he was killed before he struck the officer. But that culture of lying and the culture of impunity persists. And Yakub, um, Yakub was murdered, his children um, are fatherless and now living in a tent next to their demolished home. This is inside Israel, these are citizens of Israel, um, and this is a story of privilege too, it's a story of inequality, it's a story that says that certain lives are more valuable on the basis of who they are. And these, these people, um, the citizens of Israel who are going to move into Hiran, it's critical to note, are connected to the settlements of, in Hebron and the settlement of Susia in the West Bank. And they're living now in a forest inside Israel, waiting for the entire village to be destroyed before they can move in. <coughs> this idea that there is a bad occupation and a good Israel, that there's a division of ideas and ideologies that distinguish the occupation from the inherent nature of a state that is 
founded on the basis that certain people deserve more rights on the basis of who they are is a false notion. And so we have to, in our thinking of what the problem is and what our thinking of the solution is, center rights. Center, how do we protect the rights of all the people living on this land? And then emerge from there, the solution emerges from there. And so as our, our, my colleagues have said, the conversation is about rights. In order to end the occupation, you have to center the rights of Palestinians, you have to center the rights of people who are on that land, um, and demand equality, demand justice, demand freedom for all, and it's your responsibility. It's your responsibility. You must do it, we must do it. 50 years is not only enough, it is 50 years too many. And it isn't, and it isn't 50 years. It's a history of dispossession and a history of injustice, um, and I welcome all of your efforts to stop it. Thank you.